Chinese President Xi Jinping will start a six-day European tour to Italy, Monaco, and France on Thursday. In his first overseas trip this year, China-Europe cooperation on science and technology is expected to top the agenda. For years, China has been investing heavily on exploring basic science and advancing applied science. What's the thinking behind China's science strategy, and how will it compete against the major players in the scientific field and also cooperate with many of them? Today, let's meet one insider, Nancy Ip, a Hong Kong neuroscientist and vice president for research and development at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. As a scientist in one of the most fascinating fields, human brain, Professor Ip said that cooperation in science is necessary to improve human society. Take a look. How do you, as a scientist, see both the cooperation and particularly competition these days as a result of geopolitics when it comes to science and technology development? The ultimate goals of science and technology development uh, are to um, you know, advance the societies and it's for the betterment of humankind. Uh, and this actually requires international collaboration in order to achieve the goals. But on the other hand, uh, healthy competition, I believe, not only uh, among countries, but also in individual laboratories uh, within a country, uh, is very important in, and in fact it's essential mm -hmm. in order for us to strive for excellence and continue to, to push the frontiers of science and technology. So I believe that collaboration and competition, um, they are like two sides of a coin. Mm. Uh, and they are both important in order for us to achieve the goals. Healthy competition, of course, is always the best thing, isn't it? Uh, yes. Particularly for the <laughs> scientists uh, to gear yourself up in order to find a new frontier. However, geopolitics does play a role, and increasingly so, I'm yeah. afraid. U.S. and China, for example, yeah. uncertainty about the nature of relations for the future. Sure. So you are a member of Chinese Academy of Sciences, yeah also a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Are you concerned whether in the future that you will still be able to fulfill all these roles, free spirit, mm -hmm. as a scientist? Uh, there are so many grand challenges that we face today. In my field, for example, you know, aging population, you know, how are we going to ensure that we have healthy aging? And in other fields like, you know, climate change and also shortage of food, uh, new energy, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are grand challenges and, and it really requires multidisciplinary efforts, mm -hmm. not only within, you know, one region, but also across regions. But, you know, scientists like you work so hard in order to go the direction you just illustrated. Right. And yet you see the politics is dragging totally toward another yeah. direction. Yeah. I mean, as a scientist, how do you see that? Well, I think when we attend scientific conferences, when we give talks, you know, we share with everyone our data and we hope that by sharing our knowledge we'll inspire new ideas. It is really uh, that collaborative spirit that we can continue to, to make new discoveries. And of course, you know, in China we also uh, maybe should focus on, our, on the areas that we have a niche you know, and that would allow us to, to make uh, progress faster. In this government work report, you see the Chinese Premier made it very clear that China has grand goals, mm -hmm. but it's not against anyone right. or toward any target. Yes. Um, so it's being articulated in a very different way. During your interaction with scientists on the mainland, mm -hmm. and also when you are doing your research, how do you see this, the way of communication vis-a-vis -vis the goals mm -hmm. of research. And a good example actually I can give is the establishment of the state laboratories in Hong Kong and also branches of the uh, Chinese National Engineering Research Centers in Hong Kong. So through these platforms actually, uh, the collaborations have been very mm -hmm. productive. And now with the Greater Bay Area development, I, I believe that there will be even more opportunities for Hong Kong, you know, we have certain areas that uh, we uh, internationally recognize. Like what? For example, in my field, I think neuroscience. neuroscience, yes. But Hong Kong also has certain limitations, right? We have 
world-class universities. We have strengths in basic research. We also have, um, you know, internationalization, right? We are well connected with the uh, global scientific community. But yet, Hong Kong does not have uh, too much of an industrial base, mm -hmm. and uh, for commercialization, we have our limitations. So, this is exactly what Mingnan can offer. And so, with the Greater Bay Area Development Plan, uh, we aim to build this region into an innovation and technology hub. Mm -hmm. So, I personally feel that Hong Kong can contribute a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and with this development, I think Hong Kong uh, will see a lot of opportunities in order to better integrate into the national uh, technology, innovation and technology plan. The Greater Bay Area, Professor Yab, you mentioned several times, yes. but it's a grand plan. Yes. There's no detail yet. Yes. So where are the details going to come, and why are the details are really going to benefit neuroscience research or the areas that you in Hong Kong could really uh, develop in terms of science and technology. Uh, when is that going to come from? Well, I think it has to come from the grassroots level. That's my own view, because um, there are certain policies uh, that have been set and announced, and it is very much welcomed by the uh, scientific community in Hong Kong. I mean, for example, funding crossing the border is already, you know, a great first step, mm -hmm. so that uh, we can uh, collaborate with our mainland counterparts easier, right? So previously we have to use, for example, HKUST platform in Shenzhen in order to apply for, uh, you know, these uh, grants. But now with funding crossing the border to Hong Kong, we at HKUST can apply directly from our Clearwater Bay campus. Mm -hmm. So I see that as a wonderful opportunity. So previously we, we were simply participating mm -hmm. in certain projects, but now we can lead uh, projects and we can put together a team and then apply for the uh, for the program grant so yeah these are these are great policies I do agree uh, you know how C Hong Kong will play a role and specifically how to do that will take some time but mm -hmm. but it it's in stages right first you have certain policies that would uh, facilitate us to collaborate then the scientists in Hong Kong will respond to that mm -hmm. and you know, they will put together uh, these plans for deeper collaboration with scientists in the mainland. So, uh, so I see a lot of uh, excitement uh, in the years to come. Nancy, in, his, in her discussion with me, has discussed how important connectivity in the Greater Bay Area is for China's scientific research. Nowadays, new technology like AI, artificial intelligence, has opened new opportunities for scientific research. Yet, emerging technology brings about new moral dilemmas. She points to how the controversial case of gene-edited babies in China pushed scientific ethics to the forefront. How can we harness science to ensure that it serves the betterment of the mankind? That is an issue not only for scientists, but also for all of us. Are scientists very patient people? Scientists are very patient <laughs> people, yes, yes. And it's a very important quality. Yeah. Everything that we are talking about these days, fascinated about, almost has something to do with neuroscience. The thread hmm. of this field that could really lead one giant after another great leap forward mm -hmm. in this field. What exactly is it, that thread? Mm -hmm. I think for us in the neuroscience research uh, uh, area, I mean, it evolves over time. Uh, for example, I myself, I was a molecular and cellular neurobiologist. Yes. So I use cells, I use uh, animal models, but I have already evolve into, uh, for example, studying uh, human uh, and linking it with AI in the future. Because advances in technology development actually allow us to do things that previously was not possible. So, and that is the excitement of being a scientist. You know, we don't just stick with the old technology. When there is technological advance, we see how it can apply to our own field. Uh, tell me about how is it been evolving? What kinds of blueprint are we really looking at in the, let's just say, short and the midterm? 
A good example is for, uh, in, in understanding neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's yeah. disease. My research lab has been focusing on what are the underlying pathological mechanisms that contribute to the disease. And so we look at how brain cells communicate uh, and what goes wrong under the disease uh, condition. But now what we're thinking is that we can, for example, understand the, the, the genetic risk. Yeah. Then we can identify the, uh, the genetic risks that are associated with Alzheimer's disease in the Chinese population. So this is a new area that... Is it going to be very different from the other populations? Actually, our preliminary findings suggest that uh, the, the genetic variants or the risk factors are, are quite different from the Caucasians. Fascinating. Yeah, so in the, in the public database, actually, a lot of the work was done with Caucasians, and there's a lack of information for Alzheimer's disease uh, in the Chinese population. So a few years ago, uh, you know, I, I started the, the, data uh, the data collection and our preliminary findings suggest that the genetic variants uh, prevalent in the Caucasian population actually are not so prevalent in the Chinese population. So our goal is to link the genetic data with the uh, clinical endophenotypes and also the imaging data in order for us to have a more integrated uh, idea uh, about the risk factors and that's where AI can come in and, and, uh, and contribute. Talking about neuroscience, I have to mention to you a case earlier. Uh, there was a scientist in, on the mainland uh, trying to change the DNA and of course that case was quite well known uh, to avoid HIV AIDS but of course that was taking the risk of the other health factors of the individual particularly when it's experimenting on humans. It led to huge criticism inside the mainland and also around the world against that what the scientists did. As a neuroscientist how do you see things like this? For scientists as a whole I think having um uh, integrity and having a research, uh, adhering to the research ethics uh, is very important. I mean, this is an inter integral part of being a, a scientist, mm -hmm. and so we need to follow uh, and adhere to international standards. I really respect the human and beings. And respect the human beings. I think um, we cannot ignore this, and I always teach my students. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom line. The bottom line. I mean, of being a scientist, yes, you, you want to be the first to publish, you want to be the first to invent, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you must have ethics. And credibility is very important. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we publish and share our findings uh, with the scientific community, and they, ha they believe our data. Yes. You could see some media reports stretching the story suggesting, see, the Chinese uh, scientific circle does not have bottom line to begin with, <laughs> and, and how can we trust them? Yeah. Uh, how do you see comments like that? When the case actually broke open, um, it was at a genomic conference in Hong Kong. Were you there? Yes, I was there. Wow. Yeah, it was um, a shocking, moment. shocking moment for all of us, mm -hmm. and, and I believe that we should not let one case destroy or impact on the credibility mm -hmm. of the research done in China, mm -hmm. and uh, all of us have that responsibility uh, to, you know, to do well and, and right. to really uh, gain our credibility, yeah. In the government work report delivered by the Chinese Premier, he talked about the predictable and the unpredictable challenges right. that China is facing or will be facing mm -hmm. latter half of the year. To a scientist, what do you think is the biggest danger or biggest challenge? under this context and what can be done now in order to avoid it or at least to be prepared for it? Well, I think uh, again for scientists, there, I don't believe there's any um, you know, differences in terms of the rules and regulations or, 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 or guidance you know, that, that we can provide. I think science um, has no border in my view. And uh, there are challenges that it will continue to have challenges, but I think for us um, scientists, whether we in Hong Kong or in the mainland, I think we 
we uh, will do the best we can uh, to overcome the challenges as they happen. But if we maintain our ethical standards, our credibility, and our continue, you know, uh, uh, curiosity and our passion in mm -hmm. science, I think, I, I do think that we'll be able to overcome challenges that might come our way, mm -hmm. uh, one step at a time. I witnessed the rapid growth uh, in science and technology in our country in the past decade, and, and it is so amazing. amazing. I mean, I believe that there's so much that can be done, and I feel proud as a scientist in Hong Kong, I was able to participate in the growth in science and technology and, and be part of it. And now, you know, with the Greater Bay Area development, I really believe that we'll be able to uh, complement each other's strengths. Mm. And it is a great opportunity for us to recruit talents mm. globally. And I feel that our ability to recruit talents, our ability to retain them, so that they, they choose to stay in the Greater Bay Area would be a strong testament to the success. Nancy Yip, a neuroscientist, talking about the future. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTA, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.